Good morning. It's a joy to welcome you to the house of the Lord as we gather together to worship His holy name and receive the ministry of His word. On this fourth Sunday after Epiphany, we are getting closer and closer to the beginning of Lent. Ash Wednesday is only two and a half weeks away. And uh, during this season of Epiphany, we remember that salvation is for all nations, that Christ came for you, and he came for all people. When Lent begins in two and a half weeks, we will have our Ash Wednesday service here at 7 p.m., and it will also be live streamed. Welcome to those who are with us on live stream and watching archive footage as well, and welcome to those who are in the parking lot. It, uh, it's a little chilly, but it was fun to greet you as I walked out there this morning. Our February newsletter is in the narthex. This one is hot off the press. Uh, we've got pictures of our, our new members on here. Um, and on the inside, I had uh, Valentine's in mind with L is for the way you look at me, uh, but it became Lent themed. So, um, you know, it's, it's all there. A thank you letter in here from uh, ben and Sarah Hannon, uh, Chuck and Wanda's, Wanda's daughter Sarah, is uh, continuing treatment um, with chemo, so please pray for them. A couple recent baptism pictures in here of Bodie Carlson here two weeks ago um, in the afternoon, and um, Duke Stromland out at Reiner two weeks ago. Yesterday was the baptism of Miller, Strom Miller Stengrud, Stengrim. <laughs> Sorry, yes, Jeff and Laura. Hi, Jeff and Laura. Um, Miller Stengrim's um, baptism was yesterday uh, afternoon here at the church, and so we rejoice uh, in how the Lord is at work according to the promise of his word through baptism. Women, please note that there is the WMF sign-up for participating in various parts of each month's uh, event uh, in the North Narthex uh, um, on the kiosk. Uh, please note that our Wednesday night Bible study is continuing, but with a change. We have completed the book of Titus, uh, which was a lot of fun to study and to teach, um, and now we're transitioning to the book of Jude. Uh, Michael will be, pre will be teaching uh, about a six-week uh, lesson on the book of Jude, two weeks these next two Wednesdays, but then not during Lent, uh, because of our Wednesday night services. And then after Easter, he'll resume for about four weeks uh, until he uh, departs <laughs> to graduate and uh, to, uh, Lord willing, uh, be with an another congregation that calls him and then uh, be married in the summer and uh, it'll be busy in a good, a good season, a full season for Michael and his fiancée, Taylor. Pray for them as uh, these next few months will require the Lord's leading in, in many ways. And you're welcome to join the Wednesday night Bible study. It is both here in person in the fellowship hall and uh, through the Zoom link on our website, Wednesday night at 6.30. This Saturday is our district midwinter Bible conference, and Pastor Terry Olson is the speaker up in Greenbush. And he, re he does really appreciate uh, people being there to give a little feedback. So if you are, are feeling comfortable and willing to go up to Greenbush um, and hear Pastor Terry Olson speak on the theme Restored from Revelation 21, he'll be speaking this Friday at 7 p.m. and then twice on Saturday morning. These are in person and online if you go to the Facebook site for... United of Greenbush. Um, they will be streaming it on their Facebook Live. Our missions conference is coming up uh, in a few weeks, February 20th and 21st. Missionary John Lee, his family will be with us and he'll be speaking Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday evening, February 20th and 21st. And he has been writing devotionals for us for the last four or maybe five months in our newsletter in uh, anticipation of him coming. I reached out to him maybe in October and asked him if he'd consider that. And 
he didn't reject it, and he's been doing it. <laughs> so these have been uh, blessings to, to read each time. So I, I encourage you to take a look at those. Don has an announcement, our chairman. Thank you. Okay, we had our annual meeting uh, a couple weeks ago, and then uh, at that uh, meeting we discussed the, uh, the building project, and uh, it was brought back to us to uh, find uh, how we are going to finance that, and uh, we have been checking with a couple places, and one more place we want to check with. But to bring it back to the congregation, our Constitution says we have to have an announcement twice on, uh, on Sunday morning, to, uh, to let you know that we are going to have a special meeting on February 7th, Sunday, after the service, to discuss uh, the uh, financing and uh, going ahead with the uh, building committee uh, to build the addition on there. So uh, just put that on there, that then, uh, uh, we'll announce it next Sunday also, but after the service, we will be having a uh, special congregational meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, that congregational meeting will follow the worship service next week. Thank you. I'd ask that you'd pray for a number of people and items. Please continue to pray for Larry Roisland as he continues to receive care in Fargo with some improvements, so we're thankful for that, but please continue to pray for him and Lene. It's a long road. Um, Please also pray for Marilyn Wolf's family in the loss of her mother as she has departed and is with Christ. Our sympathies to you, Marilyn. We're praying for you and for all who loved your mother. I ask that you would pray for expecting mothers. My wife is among them, and she is uh, uh, getting closer to the due date, and so we appreciate your prayers. Um, March uh, 13th is the due date, so we're excited for that um, and ask for your continued prayers. I uh, ask that you'd also pray for all who um, would have been blessed by attending FLY this summer, as we were informed last week that due to attendance restrictions and other considerations at Estes Park in Colorado, the decision was made to quote-unquote delay the fly convention until 2023, which has the same effect as canceling this summer's fly convention because the next time it regularly would have been held is 2023. That is a significant disappointment to many youth and adults in our congregation. This is a note from the fly convention committee. It's hard to believe that it has come to this, but after recent and honest conversations with the YMCA of the Rockies, Based on the current level of COVID-19 rates in their county, along with the projections for this summer, it appears highly unlikely that they'd be able to host us for FLY 2021. Certainly, other considerations have also come into play, but that's the biggest one. Therefore, after much prayer and discussion, the 2021 FLY Committee has decided it's best in the interest of the FLY Convention to postpone until Ju July 2023. So please pray for our youth uh, pray for our uh, adults who are involved in, in leading the youth also, that there would continue to be a, a feeding and nourishment of God's word. The Fly Convention is uh, a significant part of many of our youth's um, experiences during these years, so a uh, significant loss there. Uh, I believe that the, the Bible College is proceeding with a spring campus days uh, which is, you know, a totally different animal than the fly convention, um, but is worth looking into and worth considering if you were hoping to go to the fly convention. As I grew up experiencing campus days in my youth um, as a great blessing. The flowers on the altar today are in memory of Mark Swanson, given by Annette Swanson and family. Thank you for that. 
Let us open our service now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you and ask that you would be near to us through the hearing of your word today, even as we are about to hear from Psalm 1 in the call to worship, and as we will hear from other scriptures today, you are faithful to work through your word and accomplish whatever you are purposing to send it forth to do. So do that today in our hearts. We pray that you would humble us before you so that you would be the one to raise us up through the comforting words of forgiveness in your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Our call to worship today is Psalm 1, the first of 150 psalms. Psalm 1 sets the tone with the acknowledgement that there are the righteous and there are the wicked. And the rest of the book of Psalms teaches us uh, what it means to be righteous, uh, to, to humble ourselves before the Lord and to receive forgiveness from him, but also to walk in a way that is becoming before him. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let's turn in our bulletin insert, uh, also hymn number 455, and sing together, O oh, that the Lord would guide my ways. Service continues in the bulletin as we confess together our sins, imploring God's forgiveness through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us. 
and has given his only son to die for us. And for his sake, he forgives all your sins. To them that believe on him, he gives the power to become children of God and bestows upon them his Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. God grant this to us all. Amen. At this time, I invite you to stand as you're able in honor of the reading of God's word, the epistle lesson coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. All 13 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, reading in Jesus' name. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him. And the one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some, with consciousness of the idol, until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Here ends the epistle lesson. The Holy Gospel lesson is from Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at Jesus' teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have, you, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Here ends our gospel lesson. Let us now confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed as we confess who God is and what he has done. He has revealed himself as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the God who has created redeemed, and sanctifies us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
be seated as we hear now special music. He is worthy. He is worthy. 
Thank you, Joel and Michael, Wanda and Rachel. That song, Is He Worthy, is written by Andrew Peterson, who is a musician who has performed at the Bible College and Seminary. And uh, thank you for that piece. At this time, we continue worshiping the Lord with the giving of our tithes and offerings, whether it is through the plate in the back, the mailbox in the parking lot, or giving online through the website. Let's stand and sing together the offertory response. seated as we turn and sing, Lord, keep us steadfast in thy word, an insert in your bulletin, and also hymn number 260. Good morning again, everyone. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our sermon text this morning comes from the Old Testament lesson, and that is Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 22. I'd invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of the scripture lesson. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 22. <clears throat> reading in Jesus' name. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear, according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today for your word, for your word is truth. We pray that you would sanctify us in the truth of your word, that you would use your word of law to convict us of sin in our lives where that is necessary, and also use the comforting words of the gospel to 
comfort us and, and encourage us with the promise of Jesus Christ. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, the world today, especially since the dawn of social media, seems to be yelling at us from all sides. We have news programs, TV shows, radio shows, podcasts, video games, social media feeds, constantly telling us what to think and what to believe. As a result, ironically, truth is harder to find now more than ever. News channels sometimes sound a bit more like political opinion channels, and TV shows and other forms of entertainment subtly push us to think in certain ways by painting certain characters and situations in positive and negative lights. As I said, we are being yelled at, it seems, on all sides. The Israelites, in today's text, faced a similar situation during this time in our lesson. The Israelites were about to enter the Promised Land, and as such, God was warning them of the false prophets and voices that they would be hearing from once they got there. Through Moses, God was telling them to beware of false teachers and that he would provide a true prophet like Moses, whom they should listen to. Other prophets would come after Moses, to be sure, and they certainly shared similarities with him. But God also had another prophet in mind, and that prophet was Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is the true prophet like Moses talked about in today's text. And there are kind of three markers from this text that we can take that from. First, Christ has a special relationship to God like Moses did and like the Israelites did. Second, Christ mediates between God and his people, again, like Moses and the prophets did. And finally, Christ also speaks God's word to us, like Moses did and all of the prophets did. So let's take those one at a time. The first one being Christ having a special relationship to God, like Moses and the Israelites. So one of the ways that the text says the prophet would be like Moses would be his special relationship to God. Verses 15 and 18 say that the prophet would be like Moses and he'd be taken from amidst the Israelites. Now, being like Moses, I think, can refer both to mean specifically like Moses himself as well as generally like the Israelites. Moses was special among the Old Testament prophets as being the only one who talked to God virtually face to face. And the Israelites were special in that God chose them to be his people the people through whom he would bring forth the Messiah. The people of Israel were to live differently than the nations around them, which is the main point of all of the different laws that we read about in Leviticus and in Numbers and also in Deuteronomy. They were a people with a special relationship to God, and they were to act as God's people. The rest of the Old Testament prophets also came from the Israelites, from this group of people. You think of Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and Jonah, and Elijah, and Elisha, just to name a few. All of the prophets rose from the rank of Israel. However, in contrast to Moses, pretty much all of those prophets only heard from God in visions or in dreams. But whenever Moses went to speak with God, he went and talked to God virtually face to face. Moses never saw God's face full on, but he talked directly to God as if he was talking to another person right there in the room. In the same way, Christ, the Son of God, was born an Israelite and has a special face-to-face -face relationship with God. Christ was born as a human being from Israel. Mary and Joseph were from King David's line and from the tribe of Judah, which was one of the original 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus grew, grew up in Nazareth, and he was raised in the culture of that day. He was an Israelite among your brethren, to take some words from the text. But Christ also has a unique face-to-face -face relationship with the Father. He is the Father's only begotten Son, the second person of the Trinity. Throughout Scripture, and especially in the Gospel of John, 
Jesus emphasizes this relationship to the Father that only he has. From John 1.14, Jesus' glory comes only from God the Father. John 5.37, Jesus says that he is sent from the Father and is the only one who has seen and heard the Father in all of his glory. And then from John 5.19, Jesus, the Son, says that he does the work of the Father. And those are just a few passages in John. So just like Moses and the Israelites had a special relationship to God, so too does Christ, the true prophet, have a special relationship to God. One aspect of that relationship, both for Moses and for Christ, is being the mediator between God and the people. So Christ mediates between God and his people, just like Moses and the prophets did. One of the fruits, or perks, I guess you could say, of Moses' special relationship with God was being the one who was called on to mediate between God and the people. Now, this was partly due to the fear of the people talking directly to God, as we see in verse 16. Now, this verse is a reference back to Exodus 20, verses 18 and 19. Um, At that point, the Lord had just given the Ten Commandments, and the Those verses say that there was thunder and lightning and smoke and the sound of a trumpet going on. Basically, a display of God's glory and power tied closely to the giving of the law and him speaking. And so, understandably, the Israelites became terrified. They kind of backed off and told Moses Moses to speak to them because they knew if God spoke directly to them, they would die. They were terrified of God, and this is a good fear. God had spoken his law to them, and, they, and he showed them a glimpse of his power. In the presence of that holiness and that power and that glory, the Israelites were painfully and acutely aware of their own sin and their own shortcoming. So they had Moses mediate between them and God, and that then set the precedent for future prophets. God would speak to the prophets, and then the prophets would relay that message to the people. And then when the people didn't heed those words, the prophets would oftentimes intercede for the people and pray that God would show mercy on them. And so just as Moses and the prophets mediated between God and the people, so too does Christ mediate between us and the Father. We are like the Israelites. We are full of sin. We have gone after idols and other gods, the gods of self, the gods of the god of laziness, or of pleasure, of works. We have murdered our neighbors in our hearts when we've become angry at them. We have coveted our neighbors' possessions or their lifestyle. And because of those and other sins, if we were to experience the fullness of God's power and, go- and glory completely on our own, nothing standing in between us, we would die. We would stand no chance. God's holiness cannot coexist with sin. However, in Christ, we have an advocate, a mediator between us and God. Christ takes on our flesh. He takes on our sin at the cross and gets what we deserve. He dies. But then he rises again, thus defeating sin death, and the devil for us. Now, Christ has ascended back to the Father and is there always advocating for you, dear believer. To borrow an illustration I've heard from Pastor Alex, as Satan attempts to accuse you and say, see God, this person is a horrible, terrible sinner. They need to be punished. Christ enters and says, no. That person is forgiven of their sins because I died for their sins. I paid the price and suffered the punishment for them, and they are now mine. And so because we are now Christ's by faith, we, we know without a shadow of a doubt, our prayers are heard by God the Father, and that he loves us. Christ, as our mediator, lets our requests be made known to God, and God hears our prayers with joy and with gladness, and delights in answering them for us.
What a comfort to know that we have Christ as our mediator between us and God. However, we must also remember that the work of mediation is a two-way street. Not only do we have someone who makes our requests and petitions known to God, but we also have someone who comes in down and proclaims God's word to us. As our mediator, Christ also speaks God's word to us, just like Moses and the prophets. The mark of all of the prophets was speaking the truth of God's word. They had authority from God to speak his word, and that word was to be listened to, to be honored, and to be obeyed. Excuse me. Verses 18 and 22 in our text clearly set the dividing line between true prophets and false prophets. Verse 18 says that true prophets speak God's word. They speak the words that God has put in their mouths. And then verse 22 says that if the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, and then whatever they speak doesn't happen, doesn't come to pass, then they spoke it presumptuously, and they did not receive that word from the Lord. So to give you a bit of a silly example to illustrate, let's say that someone at the beginning of this football season prophesies a very bold prediction and says that the Vikings are going to win the Super Bowl in 2021. But then say that the Chiefs win, as if that's giving a, you know, no secret who I want to win the Super Bowl this year. So then the Chiefs win. Because of that incorrect prophecy, the person would be a false prophet. And throughout church history, there have been a host of false prophets that have popped up, and they don't just wrongly predict Super Bowl winners. Because of this world of sin, these false prophets have always arisen to cause division and to deceive people, even God's own people. However, that is why God sends true prophets, and ultimately, Jesus Christ, to preach his true word. Jesus, as the true prophet, speaks God's word to people, just like all of the prophets did in the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus is the very incarnation of God's word, as John 1.14 tells us. Everything that God would ever want to tell us about our salvation and reveal to us is found and embodied in Christ. At Jesus' transfiguration, God the Father speaks and says of Jesus, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So Jesus goes forth and he speaks with a, he goes with a divine calling and he speaks with divine authority and the divine words of God the Father himself. And that means then that all Christian truth is found in Christ and his word. If there is anyone who claims to speak in the name of the Lord, including your own pastors, you should always remember to test what they are speaking by what the scripture says. As well, if you are in need of promises in this world of craziness, if you are in need of promises that are sure and certain and most certainly true, then you can find them in God's word, fulfilled in Christ. They may not all be fulfilled yet, but we know that they will be because of the promises that are fulfilled in Christ and Christ's promise to fulfill the promises that are still waiting to be fulfilled. Though it certainly doesn't feel like we're free from sin now, we are free by faith in Christ, and we will be free by sight when Christ returns. Though it seems like evil is winning the day, Christ has guaranteed that it has not won the day, and we will see that guarantee and that final victory by sight when Christ returns. For Jesus Christ is the true prophet like Moses, who is promised in today's text. He has a special relationship to God like Moses did. He mediates between God and his people like Moses did, and he, spoke, and he speaks God's word like Moses and the prophets did. Though we are being yelled at from all sides, let us not cling to or follow the words and doctrines of the world. Rather, let us heed and cherish the words of Christ our true prophet. He has promised that we will have trouble in this world, and he was right. 
However, he also promised that he has overcome the world. And in that regard, he is also right. So as we, as we wait for his return, as we heed and cherish his word, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. As we invite you to turn to our closing hymn, that is, O Word of God Incarnate, hymn 263, and you can find it in your bulletin insert as well, O Word of God Incarnate. Please continue to pray with me in our closing prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the sending of your Son, Jesus Christ, our true prophet, who proclaims your word to us, your words of law and gospel. We pray that you would um, continue to sanctify us in the truth as we prayed earlier, that we would continually heed your word, that we would not be swept about by the winds of doctrine and that we encounter today, but that we would remain steadfast in your word, as we sang earlier as well. We pray for your congregation. We pray for those in our congregation in need of prayer, thinking of Wayne and Carol and of Julia's family and Irv's family, of Raynard and the Hugland family, of Larry, of Chuck and Wanda, of Sarah, of Pam, think of Dana, and Bev, and Ruby, and Jordan, and Nancy, and Bob, Irene, 
Jan, Don, Lenore, Rose, Carol, Ed, Gordon, and all of our service men and women who are tied directly to this congregation and to the armed forces as a whole. We pray for our brothers and sisters over at Reiner. We pray for those in need over there, thinking of Jessica and Judith and Peter and Helen and Heather and Dorothy, Douglas, Jack, Tabitha, Julia, Chloe, Emmett, Bruce, Cole, Bobby, Hulda, Georgia, and Muriel. We pray for our country, Lord. We pray for all of our elected and appointed officials from the president all the way down to local officials. We pray that you would grant them wisdom and repentance where that is needed and that they would um, turn to your word as we all should to lead effectively. We pray for the unsaved, both in our country and abroad. We pray that your word would go forth, that it would shine a light in the midst of all of the chaos and darkness that we have been, we've been experiencing lately, that the light of the gospel would go forth and that as people hear it and see it, that they would not harden their hearts and reject the gospel, but that they would repent, that they would turn from their sin and turn in faith to you who sent your son to save them, all of them. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, praying the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able to receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord is with you.